Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we feeling today? Excellent. Go ahead. Yeah, so. <laughs> oh, me. That is a big call. Okay. Um, this morning's talk is a very serious presentation um, about og chopping, og chopping techniques, some recent work I've been doing on the og media servers, um, Ogsy server, and so on. And a bit of a segue into programming language techniques, ways to develop code. This is where I live. Actually, this isn't exactly where I live. It's just down the street in Kyoto. This is the Heian Jingu National Shrine. Today, uh, I'm going to have some opinions on what I'm saying. If you disagree with them, there's a, uh, there's a uh, trolling pit in the corner there. And uh, you can fight with each other. So again, the title is uh, Og Chopping Techniques for Programming Correctness and Efficiency. So what I'm going to be talking about is chopping of Og files. And it's a cooperation of a free software video server. It's required for both the clip addressing of Metavid. Who was in Michael Dale's presentation in the last session? OK, a few of you. Um, and that basically allows you to do a, um, a video editor in a in a web browser. Uh, for the for that video extension Metavid, which is going into um, um, Wiki, Wikipedia, and it's also a part of the fast video seeking Firefox 3.1. So for that, we need. Uh, I'm just going to move this. If that's okay. Okay, so we need to define this problem. Once we've defined it, we need to solve it. It's a good thing to do with the problem. We're going to go through three separate implementations. I'm just going to mention them um, and how they're different. Apache module mod Anodex, uh, CG Ensemble, HogChop, and OxyChop. Only two of these are written in C, and we're going to talk a bit about how, what the third one's about as well. But uh, it's a bit too much technical stuff. I've already talked five minutes about that. This is another temple nearby where I live. <laughs> this is my favorite one. It's called Rohanji. And when you step inside, you find a nice little rock garden like this. It's very, very famous. And uh, as you walk around the rock garden, you can see this is just one big square with rocks. You're not quite sure how many rocks there are in there. It's very, very tricky. Turns out there's 15 rocks in Rohanji, but no matter where you're standing around it, you can't see the whole picture. So for that reason, uh, so it's so it's very very popular. Here are some people, here are some people uh, contemplating. It's a very good place to come and contemplate. Um, this guy in the front knee, he's a Ruby hacker, and uh, <laughs> he's just trying to wrap his head around closures and stuff. <laughs> the woman in the middle, um, she's. Actually, like doing a proof analysis, but she's also wondering in the back of her head why, for her day job, her PHP server keeps like running into swap. And the guy at the very far corner, he's waiting for the football team to run on. <laughs> the monks have been very, um, very kind, and they've made a model of of uh, the of the rock garden so that you can actually stand up on top and count all 15 rocks. It's very, very nice of them. Um, you know, so you don't think that they're running underground and have little gnomes who are moving them where they can't see or something like that. So what we're going to be talking about today is this kind of modeling. When you've got a problem and you can't quite see your head around all of it, how do you make a model that you can get a good grip of it and then having that grip actually solve the problem rather than always hacking at it from different angles? The code word here is reify. Whenever you see a blue word in this presentation, I want you to type it in. Type it into your AltaVista or your InfoSeq or whatever it is you're using these days. <laughs> in that way, this presentation is interactive, OK? If you have a laptop in front of you, use the, use the power. As you walk further around the garden, this is my favorite part, actually. It's just around the side. And it's as I was sitting, looking at that, that I saw a student um, just sitting there and taking notes, and I thought, what an awesome place to go. I just want to go and contemplate for a couple of years. And that's what I've done, and that's what I'm talking about today. So, this cute little beast is the Firefog logo. 
It's actually a logo for, um, for the video encoding uploader Firefox extension that Michael mentioned in his previous talk, written by Jan Gerber. Who's, is Jan here? He left the country? Oh, he did too. OK, he was uh, here earlier in the week. Um, and he was at the Farms Workshop last week. Um, That's okay, that's okay. There's no Firefox people in this room. So, um, uh, there, there's a bit of a, I wouldn't say a conspiracy, a collaboration between many parts of the free software community to get this stuff working um, together. And as a result of that, um, you can get a URL like this. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a video, this is a film of Night of, Night of the Living Dead, hosted on archive.org. Night of the Living Dead, .ogv. .ogv is the file extension for OG Video. You can see RFC 5334 to check that out. That happened last year sometime. You're all typing that in, right? You're reading it. I want you to be reading these things no matter how big the document is, no matter how hard the topic is, you need to search it and read it up online because I'm not going to feed it all to you. You can get a, a uh, URL like that and you can, add a, um, you can add a query parameter onto the end of it such as that t equals time range from some random section. And when you do that, archive.org will actually stream you a newly recomposed OG video, a valid OG video file, just for that time range between 9 minutes and 51 seconds and 10 minutes and 14 seconds in this case. And I'm going to have to oh, quit out of there and... Here we are. Okay. Here's one I prepared earlier. And if I stream that, then it'll immediately load up to just that portion of the video, right? Just that portion of this classic thriller film, which is just as good as it was when it was first released. And if I take that URL and I type it into Zine, for example, then it should play directly, though, of course, it'll probably screw up with my audio on this laptop. Um, so it's just, it's just a URL, it's just a video file, it's just a video URL. Um, you can stream that to a handset, you can stream that to anything, it'll just work. I'm just going to leave that playing for the sound effects. Oh uh, yeah. We originally developed this for part of the Andex project, which was started at CSRO and is now part of a public um, foundation, the Andex uh, Association, um, in which you can take a URL like that and write it into a web page, and then you can immediately jump into part of the video, okay? So that uh, if there's a interesting portion of the video that you want to highlight and you want to you um, watch directly without having to watch the first part of it, then you can link directly to that. Is Edward Hervey in the room? No? Okay. It was really good sound effect. So anytime I want, or anytime I say like the interesting part of the video, I want you to go bow, wow, 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 wow. <laughs> Further to that, um, with the Andex project, as you're watching a video, you can actually embed a hyperlink in the video. So you can have a video that links to another video. So if you're watching one interesting part and then you go, hey, this part's also interesting, then you can link to another interesting part in another video. And this goes onwards and onwards. You can have an entirely video experience um, where you're just surfing like on a TV screen or on a phone or something, and you link from video to video. You just watch video to video. It's exactly the same architecture as we're already totally used to with, um, with the World Wide Web, with HTML, but this time for video. OK, with me so far? Implementations of this, server-side. Um, Modern Index was the first one that we did. And that was a few years ago. We demonstrated that at Linux Conf AU 2005 in Adelaide. I was in a C module for Apache. And otherwise, it was packet-based, which um, made it slow to repaginate. had to pull pages apart and then write them again. Um, to play with more uh, efficient techniques, I developed a Hog, uh, Haskell version called Hogchop, part of the Hog package. Um, 
in 2007. Page based one, and then Oxy Shop last year, page based implemented in C. And it's installed in a few places. Motivate, as Michael was showing. Padma, which is a site that Jan Gerber runs, um, the guy who did Firefog. It's a archive of Indian um, documentaries. And I'm really impressed by that stuff because it's actually doing, um, it, it actually have like little scrub lines and you can, in a web page, you can click on the video and scan through it and it's doing different HTTP requests for each um, frame when you're just jumping around through the file. And it's very, very fast. It actually feels you know, pretty much like it's a local video, even though it's all over the internet. And I'm going to describe how that kind of um, architecture is possible. Um, as, as Michael introduced before, the Internet Archive has, um, in December 2008, transcoded um, nearly 200,000 videos, probably up to that, into OGTHEORA format. And they're using OGZ-CHOP uh, to serve those which is how that um, Night of the Living Dead video is possible. Um, soon, perhaps, soon, um, upload.wikimedia.org will be serving that as well. So that anything you upload to a Wikipedia project and the Wikimedia Commons in OGTHEORA format will um, allow the time offset. Now, a lot of the point of developing this was not so that these big sites could use it, but so that anyone could set up their own web server and have a video server and publish their own videos. So, you know, OxyChop is actually a pretty lightweight kind of thing, or well, I hope it is. Um, modular bandwidth concerns. You should be setting up your own personal video server wherever possible, having people linking between video servers to, you know, save the internet and so on. That's a fun thing to do, why not? All you need to do is, you know, apt-get, yum install, whatever the Oxy tools. Um, this is the config that I ship. Some people are doing, uh, are using rewrite rules and, and so on. Um, if you're an Apache guru, I'd like to hear from you to, um, if you've got better ideas. Um, but basically, you just set it up, even just as a CGI right now. Um, the, obviously, the action of serving video for a long time is pretty low compared to, it is um, much higher than the setup cost of the CGI, so you know, it seems to work quite well. Um, as ongoing work is done, you know, faster CGI support, um, faster ways of getting this running and so on, but um, it's actually really, really, currently the, the emphasis is on being trivial to install. So you just install, um, install the Oxy tools. Use bin Oxy shop is actually a um, sort of a dual purpose executable. If you run it on the command line, it's just a command line tool. You can pass it start and end times of OG files and it'll make a new OG file for you. Um, if you run it from a CGI, then it will detect that it's running as a CGI, and it will look for HTTP headers and, and so on and so forth. All right, um, just been doing some sketches recently. Oh, you can see the bits are wiped out. Anyway, um, for how video edit architecture can work over the internet. Um, so let's say you've got a bunch of video sources like that, and you're using Oxy Shop to serve them. So you can get these preview videos. Okay, so that's just an, a video server somewhere. Um, you know, it could be archive.org, could be Wikimedia, could be your own server, whatever. And it's capable of serving bits of video like that. And you want to set up some kind of UI, the kind of thing that Michael was setting up, was demoing in his last talk. Um, the UI will give you a way of, you know, in a web browser, viewing these bits of video. Um, Michael was demonstrating a timeline sequencer, which is the kind of thing that looks like acid, uh, like um, you know, like an Avid style editor or something, um, where you actually get little representative frames of the um, sequences of video that you're sequencing, of the segments of video that you're sequencing together. Um, you do that in the web browser, and the videos are coming from elsewhere. In order to make that possible, then of course we need another um, image keyframing service, which is something on the roadmap. It's a much simpler thing, which just creates a you know, PNG from a particular part of the file. We've done that for various other projects. And you'll notice that to this UI, there's only data going into it from the video server, okay? What it's actually editing is this EDL thing. And EDL is an edit decision list, which is um, really just a list of the video sources that are in use and any information about filters that are being used on them and so on. So the UI is actually just editing an edit decision list. And um, you've got all these, you know, uh, streaming of a video coming in as you're watching it. What's the output of that? Why would you do that? 
if you, want, if you want to then make really good quality video, let's say that these video sources correspond to some DV video that, DV video that you've got lying around somewhere, then you can set up a separate rendering engine somewhere, which will read the EDL, which will say, pull in these bits of video that you need, um, get the high quality video from the video sources, and create a final, uh, final uh, cut of the video. Um, so you can imagine you know, a sort of service which can do this for you and allow you to even do high quality video editing over through a web browser which is pretty neat. Um, so yeah, so there's the video bits are in place. Um, what's really cool about this is that this UI service, it's a web app, okay? So we're talking about a web mashup kind of application here. The UI can be a completely different website, completely different people running it to the video servers, okay? So the video servers are some archive somewhere, they just want to be handling archiving and so on. The UI can be some completely different site just focused on one community group or whatever, um, with you know its own particular kind of interface, and in the web mashup sense, the video source people they don't really even need to know about it. You know, they, you don't need permission, you don't need to ask, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's basically where we're going with the technology, why we're doing it. Um, now I'm going to sort of discuss what's going on behind the scenes. I'm still in the defining the problem stage of this, and uh, and then we're going to solve it. Right. This is what a um, this is what a video stream looks like if you're looking at the um, at the stream dump kind of thing. You've got a sequence of video and audio packets, frames, so on and so forth, interleaved together so that you get them in a timely manner. Um, into your player. You get a bit of video, you get a bit of audio, a bit of audio, a bit of video. Um, the player sort of, you know, sequences them together and syncs them and works out what needs to be played when. But you, you um, delay getting stuff as, uh, until you actually need it, until the moment that you need it. Um, ignore the wayward K. So there's, um, there's a bunch of audio. This is like a, looking at the audio frames. Um, you might have some kind of pre-roll dependency in Vorbis or something. What I'm, what I'm looking at here is, if you've got one frame, what other frame does it depend on? If you want to render this audio frame, you actually also need two audio frames back. It's just because of the overlap add um, in Vorbis MDCT. It's not really. Um, it's just a. It's just a little artifact of Vorbis. Um, video sim has a different kind of dependencies where you have what's called a group of pictures. You have video keyframe. You have a bunch of iframes afterwards, which all depend on those on the keyframe or transitive will depend on the keyframe or whatever. The point of that is that if you want to render this video frame, then you need to also have this video frame's encoded data and decode these before you can render this. So let's say you're doing um, what we were doing before, where you have a URL which gives you the frame from a particular time point. Um, you've got these things, you know, just... I've drawn this, they're actually interleaved in the stream, but just for, to make it easy to see what's going on sort of separate them into separate streams, the video and the audio tracks. And what you want is you want to be able to watch the stream from this point onwards. Okay, from this time point, you want to be able to just have video playing and audio playing in sync and you haven't lost anything and it doesn't do the crackly stuff and whatever. In order to do that, you're going to need the frames that these ones depend on. This one, this audio frame depends on that audio frame and that video frame depends on that video keyframe over there. So I split it up into the, the frames that are required frames that desired. Um, yeah, it, it could be time-wise, yeah. I mean, more likely it's like this. The video is usually much much larger byte-wise as well. Usually like 10 times the size or so. Um, so you've got this, you basically need to kind of make this cut through the file, through particular frames. Yep. Um, it depends on the codec. In theory, you do, as far as my understanding goes. Um, and then, of course, you also need some kind of headers. So you have headers, you have the bit you actually want to render, you have this dependency bit that you also need, and then you've got this, all this crap in the middle, it could be gigabytes of stuff, but you dead. Just get rid of it. That's basically the algorithm that we need to implement. It's pretty straightforward. Um, any questions so far? This is the like, yep, a question. Sorry? Um, this
this is the lake at Rohanji. So once you've contemplated the rocks, then you move around and you see the lake. It's very beautiful. Oh! <laughs> now I get to the really ranty part of the talk. I'm lucky I've got my caffeine guarana drink ready. Who's up for a single one? Master, are you up for a single one, mate? Excellent. When I find my code in times of trouble, friends and colleagues come to me, speaking words of wisdom, right and see. Very good, very good. So I've been programming in C for like 15 years or more, and um, I, I love it. I love C. And I, um, then a while ago I thought, you know, I'm going to start learning some other languages as well. And you know, to be honest, learning Python, for example, it improved my productivity like five times. For, you know, for the kind of tasks Python is good for, really just, you know, you can bang out some code really quickly. That's great. Small talk, ha, that was fun. Um, Squeak small talk's really hackable. No, it's different. I want to like learn, you know, you learn different things. The point of this is a stretch language. You try to learn something completely different. It changes the way you think about how you're programming. Squeak small talk is really hackable. It's this whole sort of OS UI image thing and you can hack any part of it right down to the kernel layer and then you can shoot yourself and then you've got no way to maintain it and merge it with other people's work. But it was fun. So anyway, you should learn a new programming language. What new programming language should you learn? Did I prime you guys or something? <laughs> what I want like to say is that the programming language you learn is really up to you. It's really it's a personal decision, and I don't want to be imposing my views on you about that. Um, but anyway, this is a uh, this is a new book, Real World Hustle. It came out last month, um, New Early, and uh, by my good mate Don Stewart and uh, Brian O'Sullivan, John Gosen, who um, pretty well known hackers from various parts of the of different communities, and. Um, it's really opening up a lot of people to what they can do with Haskell. You can actually just go to realworldhaskell.org and you can read it, the whole thing online. If you don't want to buy it, or you can buy it, I don't know. Who has never done Haskell before? Yep. Okay, keep your hand up, keep your hand up, okay? Keep your hand up if you've never done Haskell, you don't really know what it is. Okay. Now you've probably, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Now you've probably heard that Haskell's really hard, it's really difficult, you know, it's all got all this mathy crap in it and so on and so forth, right? Keep your hand up, keep your hand up if you can't explain what this code does. Sorry? Well, it's an implementation of CP, but I mean, can you explain how it works? Maybe I made it obvious by putting the heading there, that wasn't really the point. But the point is that this isn't hard to read, right? And this hasn't got like, you know, weird types and math and all kind of crap like that all over it. So what does it do? Well, you import some library, whatever. Um, system environments used for get args, right? So you can get your argc and argv inwards. Um, okay, so you read your info and outline, out file from the command line. Uh, what are they? Probably just strings or something, right? Um, we've got this read file function which puts in file into some s thing and then you write s into the out file, right? What if this file is pretty big? What if we're talking like, you know, a couple of gig of video or something? What happens? Right, it looks like you might run out of memory, right? This s thing is going to get pretty big. We don't like that lying around. So how do we measure what's actually going on here? Do you guys like do I, <laughs> do you guys actually read my abstract or something? <laughs> right. So when you so when you've got a program and it's just a binary on a Linux system and you want to know what's going on, you run S trace on it. And what if it's in like some whack up functional programming language? Who cares? Just run S trace on it anyway. So you build that with GHC and you run a command like this, just normal S trace command, and Funnily enough, these are called, you know, I name all my files big file, so on like that. I've got test files called bigfile.org. And blah, blah, blah. 
you end up with this kind of thing going on, where you have read-write loops. And um, here what's happening is that the program, the compiler has actually set it up so that it'll just read here in 8K blocks, and then write back in 8K blocks, and so on and so forth. And you can actually write Haskell code that is pretty close, close to f as the same efficiency as C, certainly better than like, you know, Perl, Python, Ruby, or whatever. Um, but with this kind of simplicity of programming, okay? So you have this kind of simplicity of code rather than, you know, a couple hundred lines of C code to set up and, um, you know, play with stand by and so on and so forth. So, um, so it's really nice because you don't have to think at some ridiculous low level, you can just sort of think at a higher level about the problem that you want to solve. Lazy evaluation reifies the infinite and the unknown. I was teaching a class to um, Doshisha Women's College in near Kyoto. Um, first year students in, in a liberal arts college and they have no programming experience whatsoever. After I taught them um, how to write Excel functions and stuff, then we did a little Haskell class. Those who didn't fall asleep actually got it and they did really, really well. And I scared them by using the repeat function. You know, you repeat a string and it just keeps printing the string onwards and onwards, just like, you know, doing 10 print, hello, go to 10. And they were shocked out, ah, what's going on? And I didn't know what to do. And it's like, you're working with the unknown. You're working with the infinite. What you need to be able to do is have this kind of object, this thing that's an infinite stream, an infinite computation, and grab it and work with it, right? And it no longer becomes a scary thing. With lazy evaluation, you don't always know what the result, what the next step of the computation is going to be, but you can work with the idea of that next step anyway. For those of you who can read Haskell, um, and those of you who can't, here's a classic example of lazy evaluation in Haskell. This is a Fibonacci program. Um, you'll notice that the, just to talk through it, the name of the function is called Fib, right? It's a Fibonacci program. Uh, the value that it's equal to is, is a list, which starts with the value 1, then the next value is 1, and then it's appended to this other list. The contents of that list is a whole lot of A plus Bs, and the contents are basically like the the first value of fib um, added to like the next value of fib onwards and onwards. So it refers to itself, right? So if you try to di draw a diagram of like what's going on here, then well, it'll actually work itself out. You actually start with only these two values, and um, it generates the rest of itself. Now, what will happen if I was to type this in? It would just keep printing the Fibonacci sequence endlessly. You can just say to like give me the first ten values of it, and it'll give you those. GHC is a wonderful bit of free software developed by a good free software company, Microsoft Research, Cambridge UK. It's BSD licensed. It's a compiler. It builds platform binaries, so you can just build a binary and run it. Right. It also includes a read of our, uh, a REPL thingy. So those of you who are used to Ruby, Python, whatever, um, you can just fiddle around with it. You can just run GHCI. You can type code into it, play around, see what's going on. So for example, you can type in you know, get line. And so I type in get line, I type in hi there, and it comes back with hi there. I can examine the type of that get line function, right? So get line is a function. And its type, I can see here, when I say what's the type of get line, it says get line is of type IO string. Right, what's this IO string business all about? IO functions. An IO string is a compound type. It states that a string is the result of some IO operation. So a function type IO string, like that last get line, might return a different value each time it's called. Okay? Think about why that's useful. Any function that calls an IO function itself is then an IO function. So if you're used to something like the uh, tainted mode in Perl, where you get a variable in from the internet, and unless you clean it any time you use it, then if you assign it to another value or whatever, that value is also you know, tainted as bad data from the internet. Um, IO is always passed through. So an IO function, if an IO function is called, the caller becomes an IO function. The opposite of those are pure functions. Now, those of you who are you know, playing the right game and typing in all the blue words um, can jump ahead and find out where that first quote comes from. 
pure function is one that has no effects except the return value, and where that return value depends only on the parameters and or global values. Okay, so something like a um, a function that writes to the sound card, for example, it might not give any result back to the program, but it has an effect on the outside world, so it's not pure. If you have a pure function, um, then the compiler can go, wait a minute, I can just run this once, work out what the output is, and then remember that output. I can cache the value of that function, right? Um, or you can do that in your program. And when you do that kind of caching, it's known as memoization. It's a nice technique. But in order to do that, you need to know that a function is pure. And for a function to be pure, it can only call pure functions. In Haskell, all functions are pure by default. Um, this has led to a lot of confusion about how to deal with I.O. If you learned an earlier language like Miranda, then there was, which is one of the things Haskell was based on, then um, I.O. was awkward. But in Haskell, of course, the I.O. functions are explicitly marked, like get line is an I.O. string function. So what this actually does, the effect on your program development, is that it encourages, encourages you to develop an algorithm using only pure functions and debug that and you know, get a really good feeling that your core algorithm is correct. And then you write interfaces to that, the stuff that deals with files and networks and so on. And only those interfaces use the I.O. functions. But any processing that's going on, you know, any whatever, customer logic, your algorithm, whatever, um, you try to do in pure functions as much as possible. OK, C. So that earlier quote came from the GCC function attributes page. Um, who knew that? Who was playing along God already? Woo! Good work. So a pure function can be subject to common sub-expression elimination and loop optimization, just as an arithmetic operator would be. Okay, so you can do, so uh, GCC can do good optimizations with pure functions. And in order to um, annotate a pure function, um, you just add an attribute pure to the function declaration, and, uh, and there you go. GCC will know about it. Common examples of pure functions in C, string lang, mem compare. The point there is that if you call a pure function with the same arguments, then it will give you the same result, okay? So the length of hello is always whatever it is, five characters. Um, and the value of mem compare for the same memory regions, for the same memory inputs, is going to be the same. Child's play, really? Yes, ozone. Um, how can script Yeah, I was just thinking that as I was reading it out. I copied that from the GCC manual, so I hope it's correct. Um, <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. Const is stronger than pure in that sense, and it's already got const. But if you had that page in front of you, then you'd know it already because it's all there. <laughs> Use your Alta Vistas. So. So those kind of type annotations are good. Types are good. Um, I'm going to promise you in this uh, part where I'm talking about Haskell, I'm not going to talk about monads at all. I just want to make that clear. Because they're scary. I'm going to talk about a nice puzzle. Some of you might know what this is. What's this? It's a, it's a lot of little puzzle where you get a bunch of cubes of different colors, with different colors on their faces, and you have to stack them one on top of each other. And you have to do it in such a way that no face of that stack has the same color repeated twice. Okay? And it's quite infuriating. Um, the puzzle is called Instant Insanity, but it's actually rather straightforward to program with a simple backtracking algorithm. However, to have more fun, I decided to program it in the type level, which basically means in the type annotations of um, Haskell. So a type level implementation of this puzzle. And as you can see, the type level implementation is much more fun than the boring code backtracking implementation. Type level, normal code. Type level, normal code. Type level instant insanity is a implementation of the instant insanity puzzle entirely in the Haskell type system, extended with multiple parameter type classes and undecidable instances. It was a tutorial in the monad reader issue number eight a couple of years ago. 
Um, and it was followed up by on um, the Haskell Cafe mailing list, which you should go into if you're into getting into this. Programming.reddit.com, which you should be leaving because it's just getting full of crud. Um, by implementations in C++ templates, D, and uh, even back then in Haskell with type families, which is a newer um, set of extensions, or it's even in GHC recently, for, um, for dealing with types. So that was a whole lot of fun to write. And this is the this is the intro I wrote. I'm not going to go through the rest of it because it goes onwards and onwards, and I, I really want to encourage you to read the tutorial in the Monad Reader issue 8. You're swimming in a sea of atomic constants like X. It's just the num just the, 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 the constant X, the concept of the constant X. They're not numeric constants, they don't hold a value, they just exist, and all you can do is create relations between them. If you want features like numbers and arithmetic or even Boolean logic, you have to create them. You have to create those features. And where this concept comes from is combinator theory, um, which was early de uh, developed by Schoenfinkel. A, uh, the aim was basically to try to make computation just out of these kinds of relationships. So you're, rather than looking at numbers and um, uh, rather than looking at the, the, the values that are being added and, and whatever, you're just looking at the relationships themselves and the concept of relationships and building up mathematics from just relationships, not constants. Oh, sorry, not, um, not numbers. This basically led to a whole different way of, um, or to, to a nice way of formalizing, formalizing math. Um, and then onwards and upwards into lambda calculus and type theory, um, which I don't think I'm going to go into now because I don't have time. Then we move on to continuations. Continuations reify computations. What the hell does that mean? Can anyone explain that? No, OK. So continuations. Um, who is uh, familiar with continuations in Ruby, for example? or anywhere, any language. Yeah, cool, okay. So basically what you do with a continuation is you, um, you, you, you grab the concept, the state of a computation of everything that needs to be done, everything that's been done up to this point. Um, and you can then use that and apply it to other things that need to be computed. In C, you can't really do this at the language level because you need stack hacks and so on and so forth. But um, continuations are fun. I was very uh, lucky. I had a lot of fun to be in the right place to go to a continuation fest in Akihabara last year. And um, it was a full day workshop just on continuations. It was awesome. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the presentations there was um, by a guy called Shinji Kono, I think, from um, the south part of Japan. Continuation-based C, C-like language capable of expressing continuations, non-local jumps, multiple function entry points. It was nasty, but you could do some really interesting stuff with it. Um, it, it was a GCC RTL output um, at, at the RTL level. And uh, it, yeah, it let you basically do continuation-based stuff. Um, unfortunately, it was like on a pretty old hack of, well, GCC4, but it, it was a bit out of date and there were some maintenance issues. But um, a fun thing to do. Um, and, oh, I forgot my devil. Wait a minute. I knew something was missing. Uh, at the continuation fest, there was there's a guy called Oleg. Who's heard of Oleg? Right, Oleg Kaseliev was there, and I met him and had dinner with him. It was great. And, um, and Oleg was working on uh, continuation-based web servers, um, web applications where the state of the application is saved, is um, kept consistent across the back button, across multiple tabs. So um, a user can be interacting with a website in many different places and have a consistent view of it um, the whole time. And when you write a website in a continuation-based system, then you're basically writing as if it was a local application um, where you're just getting, where each form input or whatever is just 
another part of your input loop rather than, rather than refactoring your program into dealing with each page, page by page. It's a very nice way to do it. Um, Oleg's been doing some work on then extending, extending that to have um, parallelize, parallelizability. And it was very cool. 10 minutes? Great. Good, because we're going to talk about algebra. Who likes algebra? Yay! Yay! I, I brought my double along because he loves algebra. He loves math, right? You talk about math, right? Talk about math. And he's just like, math, math, math. <laughs> rah, rah, math, math, math. And I was talking to him about algebra last night, and he was just going crazy, like, rah, rah, crazy, algebras. Monads. I promise I wouldn't talk about monads. <laughs> a monoid is a algebra. It's a type in Haskell, at least, the implementation, but uh, is a type. Two elements that, of that type can be combined in order to make another element of the same type. Sounds like fun. There also needs to be an element that you can think of as representing nothing in the sense that when it's combined with other elements, it leaves the other elements unchanged. Uh, there's a dude called CF, who's Nick is CFP8, Lucas Arts, and he wrote a really good blog post on this called titled Haskell Monoids and Their Uses. I encourage you to read it. It's a lot of fun. Um, some examples of monoids. Oh, I left the minus signs in. Numbers. Hey, 3 plus 7 equals 10. That's a good monoid. Lists. Um, ABC concatenated with DE is ABC DEF. ABC concatenated with nothing is ABC. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> Bloody open office is useless. <laughs> That's what you get with like dynamically typed presentation software. <laughs> Ranges, where the combining is the operator. 3 to 8 and 5 to 12 gives you 3 to 12, and so on and so forth. Odd time ranges, that sounds like a great monoid. That'll be fun. Um, well, elements of the time subranges of an OG file, and combining time ranges is the operator. You want to have partial ordering on the pages. That's just at the odd page level. And you want to be able to generalize this to the kind of problem we were talking about before, which was headers plus you know, const the constructed or dependent section, um, and the rest of it, the bit you're copying. And what we'd like to do with future versions of OG is then generalize this to having multiple ranges that you're piecing together, um, which, is, which is where that star comes from over there. And in order to do that, then you know, it starts getting a little bit trickier. So hell, why not make an algebra for it? How about a byte range algebra? An algebra for sequencing, interleaving, dealing with modified parts of the, of the uh, OG stream. So if you've got an input stream which you can consider as a concatenation, or a sequence of headers, a bit you're going to delete, the bit you're preparing in between, the bit you're going to copy afterwards, and an output which is some modified headers, a modified bit of preparation section, and an unmodified copy section, then you're going to do that by this particular algorithm where you do some kind of modification to the different parts of the OG stream. The whole point of this, I'm not going to go into the OG details, but the point is that the copied sections are the same in the input and the output. And what we're going to do is then um, use HTTP 1.1 byte range requests and byte range recombining in caching proxies to ensure that uh, the copied bits are referred to are always the same chunks that are referred to on the, on the internet, on the web. So why not make an algebra for it? The sequencing operation, well then in OG to find a byte boundary, so that's important because we want to be able we want to be looking for byte boundaries that we're then going to turn into HTTP um, range requests. The interleaving is time time-wise interleaving. Um, where we have those kind of uh, relationships. Um, by making an algebra, then we can work on some um, work on some invariants, and then we can ensure that our code. If it meets these invariants and keeps creating valid OG files, then it'll pretty much cover any kind of problem that we're going to come up with. This is as opposed to the old style approach of just hacking it and you know kind of hoping that it works and getting something that kind of mainly works, and then like integrating it with someone else's code that does something slightly differently, and then like fixing it a bit so that works again, and then like you know integration testing for years and years, and we all love that. Um, define the problem, you know, in, in a sort of complete logical manner, and then um, you know, try to try to solve it. Let's happy reify byte-wise merging of OG time ranges such that the output is valid OG. Yay, that's where we're at. Who is in the web shop of some kind or something like that? Who loves agile programming? 
Yeah, I mean, it's good. It's good. It works. It's great for working in an environment with you know evolving customer requirements. What I'm talking about here is the kind of thing where you get some code, you change it, you get feedback, you change it, you, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, in that sense, it's kind of like lazy evaluation of the customer requirements because they don't know what they want. <laughs> but it's not so great for implementing a well-definable problem. If you can grab the problem and just go, right, this is the entirety of the problem, and I'm going to make it work. So I introduced a two-step programming methodology. <laughs> So there is to it, you define the problem, and then you solve it. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay, so maybe it's not that easy, but the point of this is that learning new tools and techniques can go a long way towards writing better code. And um, when you can define a subset of the problem, and you actually can define it, then it is possible to solve it. So we're going to talk about the complementary roles of proof and testing. This is pretty much where I'm going to end up, I guess. Um, regression testing is very necessary for ensuring that known bugs don't reappear. Proof ensures that there are no unknown bugs for a given definable problem. You've got to define the problem properly for that to be working. By the current paradigms, isomorphism a type can be a proof for a program, but you need a good type system for that. I like to think of the uh, Haskell compiler, for example, um, the type checker. Some people think it's a bit of a pain. You have all these like rude messages screamed at you when you make a tiny mistake. Um, that's why a lot of people run to, you know, run to Python or whatever. In which case, the rude messages scream at their customers six months later instead, and then they get a phone call at 3 a.m. Um, but yeah, I like to get the problems told to me up front, and so I like to think of the type checker as more of a bug checker, a bug finder. And when you think of it like that, then it's like, damn, I want one of them. And it's, it's often very true that people who are writing Haskell code will uh, write something, and it will just work the first time. And it really freaks you out the, you know, the first few times that happens. And then you start getting used to it. It's like, hey, it compiles, and it just works. It's really good. And so you know, I've actually found that doing stuff in Haskell is then maybe another two to three times improvement over doing in Python, which was then you know, a performance improvement over a um, productivity improvement over C. So it's quite, quite nice. Right, so then we get to the same lake another, you know, six months later, and everything's pretty. I'm going to skip over where we were going with that, with the uh, byte range recombining stuff. If you've got any questions about that, then come and chat to me during the rest of the conference. Um, and that basically the, the ongoing work of that, just to talk about the future work, is, um, oh, we're not up to that yet. Um, <laughs> to talk about the future work, uh, which, as Michael mentioned, I'll be doing for um, Mozilla through Wikipedia um, for the next six months or so, is just, I'm just working a day a week or something, but um, I'm making sure that the OGSI serve stuff works really well with Firefox 3.1, so that the um, OG video um, support is, you know, as good as it can be in Firefox, um, and also on the seeking part of that, at least, you know, as good as it can be from my point of bits I'm doing, which is the seeking and the serving stuff. So that kind of integration is going to be really, really good. Um, and you know, to having that cooperation between Ziff.org, who's doing the codec development stuff, um, Mozilla, Wikipedia, and all these other groups like archive.org involved is um, really building well for the you know, free software and free codec scene. And the kinds of applications that we can build are going to be really, really awesome. OK, my rant is over. Um, Unfortunately, we're out of time, so if you do have any questions, if I've like, you know, um, said bad things about your favorite language, then um, you, can, you can email me or something. Um, now you can chat with me at lunch. I mentioned Firefox. That logo doesn't exist. I really want to go to Rob Savoy's talk at 4 o'clock on why open media matters. Sylvia mentioned it this morning at the, before the keynote, but um, for those who weren't there, it's about legal issues and fight around media codec patterns. It's a big problem. Button busting stories, lots of shenanigans, encourage you all to go. So, conclusion here is please learn a new language. Learn Haskell. Have fun. Thank you.